Hi everyone, and welcome to our first installment of Very Terry Tuesday, a series of hangouts that Crossover Media is doing throughout the month of June to celebrate the 80th birthday of Terry Riley. Our guest today is here to talk about um, Terry Riley, of course, and he's New Music USA composer advocate, Franco Terry. Um, first, a bit about Frank composer advocate at New Music USA and the founding editor of its web magazine New Music Box, Frank J. O'Terry has been an outspoken crusader for new music and the breaking down of barriers between music genres his entire career. Frank has written for BBC Music Chamber Music Magazine, Ear Magazine, Playbill, Symphony, Time Out New York, and the revised New Grove Dictionary of Music. He's also been a frequent radio and pre-concert speaker and has served as host for ASCAP's Through the Walls Showcase and his own 21st Century Schizoid Music Series at Cornelius Street Cafe in New York City. Frank is also a member of the Cultural Exchange Working Group coordinated by the Performing Arts Alliance and co-chairs the Communication Committee of the International Association of Music Information Centers. Frank, we're so glad to have you here today. How are you? Yeah, good. Good. That's <laughs> quite a, quite an intro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Done a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's 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 very wonderful and I'm deeply honored to be part of a celebration of the 80th birthday of one of the living legends of music, one of my role models. This has been a role model for me all my life as a composer, as a human being, as an advocate for other music and as just, you know, one of the most wonderful people I have ever met in my life, Terry Riley. Yeah, oh, we're thrilled to have you on board. Um, so to get started, let's start at the beginning. Um, you have a BA and, and an MA in Ethnomusicology from Columbia University. And while at Columbia, you served as a classical and world music director for the radio station WKCR-FM. I did not know that you were a radio guy. Can you tell me a bit about that? Well, well that was, well, it was, it was a number of decades ago at, <laughs> at, at this point, um, but I um, I was very interested in getting, and it, it's something I still do with New Music Box, I'm very interested in getting people to listen to music I'm excited by. So, you know, there are many ways of doing it. You know, we can have a conversation now and I can say, you need to listen to this. Or I could do an article for a publication and say that, or I can give a pre-concert talk and say that, or I can you know, edit a web magazine and say that, or I could be on air and say that and actually have the recordings and play them. So, you know, I did that. I started collecting records when I was in high school, and by the time I got to college, I had amassed a number of recordings. And what's interesting is, you know, most people at the time would use WKCR's quite wonderful record collection, but I always used my own record collection because if there was something I wanted to hear that was in their collection, I'd go out and buy my own copy of it. And, you know, I, I say that all as, as preface because early on, one of the life-changing experiences for me when I was in high school was buying two LPs of Terry Riley's music at a record shop in Greenwich Village. And it was, it was really a life-changing event. Yeah. Hearing, hearing that music for the first time and, and, and you know, hearing the possibilities of what was in that music. The, the, the newness of it, although, you know, I'll say, it was the music was almost 20 years old by the time I finally got around to knowing it existed. But the newness of it for me and the openness of it, the warmth of it, the the inclusivity of it was just a very fundamental kind of mind changing, like kind of like going in that direction for the rest of my life thing from hearing those records. Absolutely. Um, how do you feel that Terry Riley's um, minimalistic approach or multi-genre approach, you could call it, really his unique approach, how did it affect your own compositional works? Well, you know, that's the thing. I mean, he, he found a way, his, the piece that, that sort of put him on the map for so many people, although he did amazing things even before that, in C, I mean, the title alone already tells you um, I, I give away my age when I say this, NC is as old as I am. They're both, <laughs> me and NC are both from the year 1964. But for people who are around then, you know, I, I can't say I remember 1964 very well because I don't. I was just born. But for people who are around then, to call a piece in C was a really radical thing to do. People were not writing pieces that were in keys that way. But his writing the piece in C was in no way a throwback to earlier music that was tonally based. He created a completely new tonal language that, that was tonal, that was harmonious, that you could hum, that, that had a rhythm, but it was a completely new sense of rhythm, a completely new sense of groove. It, it's, 
it's a deal changing piece. It's a history changing piece. But that's one of many, and you know, but that is the piece for which he became world renowned. Right. So for NC, am I right that it consists of 53 separate modules of, they're about one measure a piece, each containing different musical patterns. Um, is all the, all, all the music written out? Yes. The 50, well, all that's written out are the 53 cells. You have these little cells and the first one's just ba-da, ba-da, ba-da. It's, it's the note, it's C is a grace note going to E and mm -hmm. it's that. And the instruction of these 53 modules is everybody gets them, they're all very neat on one sheet of paper, 53 measures, and you keep playing each measure over and over again as many times as you personally feel like it. You move on to the next one whenever you want to. So there's no conductor saying you have to go here, you have to go there. And when everybody gets to the 53rd one, when they're all together there, that's when the piece ends. So every performance of it, is slightly different from every other performance and you get these incredible layers of counterpoint that occur differently depending on how many people are playing it and it, and it could be for any group of musicians it could be for a small group of people say a quartet it could be for like a whole orchestra and you you get a completely different sound world each time both in terms of different timbres but also in terms of these different layers of counterpoint that happen in the moment. And I have to say, you know, decades later, I was very lucky. One of the great experiences I had as a player was I was asked by Paul Morata, who, who fronts an indie rock band, uh, an, an early, back before they used the term indie rock, a, um, a, a garage sort of post-punk band called the Styrenes. And they did in C for rock band wow. with guest musicians. And they asked me to sit in with them on fiddle and with a group of musicians and playing that piece live you know, multiple times in clubs for in front of a live audience where it was different every time and was completely new for whoever heard the piece was one of the most you know life affirming things as a musician and as a person it's it playing it is like the experience of playing no other piece of music i can i can think of you know there are at least you know there are probably 30 you know, here, here's where my expertise fails me because new ones happen all the time. But I can think of at least 30 different recordings of this piece yeah. for different forces. You know, there's, there's an early music um, vocal group that has a complete unaccompanied vocal version of it. Then there are jazz improvisers who've done, you know, performances of it. Then groups that Terry has led, groups of Asian instruments that have, have played this piece. There's a recording for six pianos, um, this, this group Piano Circus, this British group that plays on six digital pianos, does it all on keyboards. So you know, it becomes all these different things and, and several rock groups have taken it on, not just the Styrenes, but this crazy Japanese psychedelic band, Acid Mother's Temple did this really tripped out recording of it. And you know, they're all the piece. Yeah. But they're all their own thing as well. So it's very, it's very exciting. There's a wonderful book about this phenomenon, the whole performance history of NC by a composer, and a wonderful composer in his own right named Robert Carl, that is definitely worth checking out. And I did a talk with Robert Carl for New Music Box about that book. And that, that talk is still online. People can look that up on New Music Box to read more about his, he's really the authority on, on that particular piece. We know that during Terry's form, formative years that he was very influenced by jazz composers and jazz musicians like Coltrane, Miles Davis, Bill Evans, uh, Gil Evans, Mingus. Um, and Chet Baker, you know, he Chet actually Baker, did yeah. a piece with Chet Baker pre in C. You know, he was in Europe in the 60s and he did this thing with, with Chet Baker. And of course, through his own long-term association with Lamont Young, mm. who also, you know, was the, the, the founding father of minimalism, who was also very deeply immersed in jazz and, and in fact, you know, played with Eric Dolphy and, and Ornette Coleman and all these people. So there's this, there's this wonderful moment in time where people who we call, you know, classical and people we call jazz, you know, came together. They, they didn't use those terms. Marketers use those terms. For them, yeah. it, was, it was music. It was a lot bigger than, than a label. Would you say that, uh, that Terry's compositions are improvisational in nature? Um, 
it depends, you know, to make a generalization. A lot of them are, um, yeah. you know, not all of them are. There are completely notated pieces that he wrote. He wrote, you know, tons of string quartets. After years of not writing down any of his music, he went through a, a long period where he wasn't writing down anything to just really be freer in, and be in the moment with things. But then David Harrington of the Kronos Quartet approached him to write string quartet, and he loved string quartets. He had actually written as a, as a student very early on a really fascinating string quartet that only recently has gotten out there and has been published and recorded and is now available. Um, it was actually a 12-tone piece that predates you know, all the, the whole minimalist stuff he, he became famous for. Um, but those are, those are written out pieces, although some of them also have other sections and have collaborations with other musicians that are more open-ended. So it's very, he has orchestra pieces that are completely yeah. written out. Um, there are solo piano pieces that are completely written out. And then there are also solo piano pieces that are complete improvisations. Like, you know, I, and we're going to get to talking about the marvelous recording that Zofo just did. Yeah. That just, well, they just, that's just been released of his forehand piano music, which is, a, you know, that's all notated out music. But in keeping with Terry's openness, it's interesting, not every piece on there is a notated out 100% by Terry piece. There are some pieces on there that are arrangements by the two members of Zofo of other pieces of his, a string quartet, um, in, in one case a solo piano piece, and another that they reworked with his blessing for piano forehands that he then added further to, and it became almost like a co-arrangement. But that's, you know, that's how he is. He's this open, giving person. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so you mentioned the Kronos Quartet. Can you tell me a bit about that collaboration? Do you know um, when that association began? Uh, in, since the 70s. You know, mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking, you know, it's now 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, teens. It's now in its fifth decade. It's like some 40 plus years of them working together and, you know, a remarkable body of music. In fact, I would dare say Terry Riley is probably the most prolific living composer of string quartets. And, you know, it, it's it's not as many at this point as, as Franz Joseph Haydn, but, you know, he's still got some, some more years to go, so maybe he'll he'll beat Haydn's 83 quartets. Um, but it's 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 a vast body of repertoire. He was also deeply influenced by world music and um, he also regularly appears in concerts of Indian classical music. Um, can you tell me more about that as well? Well, yeah. I, in, the, in the 60s, the other, I, I should say, when I picked up those records by Terry Riley when I was in high school, I picked up two records. One of them was in C. The other was a record called A Rainbow in Curved Air, which in some ways was just as life-changing. In some ways, for me personally, perhaps more life-changing because it was a piece for a solo keyboard, multi-tracked, and the other side, it, one side was a solo keyboard piece, the other side was a, a solo sax piece called Poppy No Good and the Phantom Band, where he was playing saxophone into this thing called the Time Lag Accumulator, which actually predates the, the things that Brian Eno and Robert Fripp were doing a few years later for Pertronics, and the whole, that whole collaboration where they had one line going through a delay unit and repeating. Terry pioneered that with the time lag accumulator. And hearing that, I thought, wow, one person solo could create this entire sound world through multi-layering multi -layering all by him or herself and do this incredible thing. And so I picked up a delay unit, got a synthesizer, <laughs> and, you know, you know, inspired, just like, you know, all the, all the, all the kids who heard Jimi Hendrix records went out and bought an electric guitar. I, I went out and did Synthesizer with Delay because of hearing Terry Riley's A Rainbow and Curved Air. But I bring it up in the context of what you're saying about Indian music because it's really, it, it is the piece that led to this very deep immersion for him into studying modes and modal theory and immersing himself as a result in classical Indian ragas and becoming a disciple of Panti Pranath, along with Lamont Young, both of them became disciples of this extraordinary Hindustani vocalist, Panti Pranath, one of the, the great Kyal singers, and learned ragas that way through singing them. And he immersed himself. In fact, I, I love telling this story about Terry Riley. 
he was under a record contract for for the label that was Columbia Records, Columbia Masterworks. And he had done a record with John Cale of the Velvet Underground called The Church of Anthrax. It's a little known record. It's really a cool record too. And then he they released In C and they released A Rainbow and Curved Air. But he was under contract to do another record and he never did it. Well, he did eventually do it. I should, I, I, I should <laughs> not find that so much. He never, instead of completing the, the last record he was supposed to do for them as planned, he ran off to India and immersed himself in this music and did all this stuff and said he felt I wasn't ready. He didn't want to deal with the fame. You know, other people would say, oh, like, make another record and do the tour and everything. He felt he wanted to really more deeply immerse himself in this music. And when he finally did the, the final record that they eventually put out, years later, in 1980, a record called Shri Kamo, um, it was the fruits of this, this total immersion in the study of Raga. And it's this complete, unique take. You know, it's inspired by Indian music, yet it's completely his own. It's deeply improvisational, but it, it, he also works with altered tunings. He's retuned scales to, to more approximate the just intonation, the pure intonation of Indian music and a lot of the other world's traditional musics. So, you know, this is the kind of immersion that he's done in, in all these pieces. And Indian music is probably the music he's immersed himself into the most. But if you listen to all of his recordings of keyboard improvisations and compositions he wrote for saxophone quartet, string quartet and, and the material, in fact, on, on Zofo's recording, you can hear not only Indian music and jazz, you can hear traces of gamelan music, traces of East Asian musics, African musics. These are all, what, what Terry Riley said is, this is all our vocabulary. And certainly there are other composers who did this as well, you know, Lou Harrison, Henry Cowell, even before him, but but Terry did it not only as a composer, he did it as a performer. And to immerse himself so deeply in all these traditions as a composer and as a performer, I think sent the message to generations of musicians that the possibilities were endless, that we're living in one world, all this music is ours as, as a human race. It belongs to all of us equally. And I, I, I think that that, you know, that message comes across in his music very well. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Terry Riley has such a vast repertoire with so many different elements to his music. Um, can you tell me like what other pieces stick out in your mind as something that's really unique or something that's influenced you um, influenced you deeply? <laughs> well, I, I mentioned I mentioned a Rainbow and Curved Air, this incredible yeah. you know multi keyboard, multi track keyboard improv piece. Um, Poppy No Good is also amazing. It's, sadly, he never played the saxophone again after he did this. You, you were mentioning Coltrane and I mentioned Eric Dolphy. You know, here you really hear Terry Riley's contribution as a saxophonist, but after he started immersing himself in classical Indian voice, he put down the saxophone and hasn't really pursued it, but that's an extraordinary. He the record that was released in the 60s is just a side of an LP, but he would play this as an all-night concert, you know, starting at like you know, 10 in the morning, going till 4 a.m., an all-night concert. And there's there there's a longer recording of it that was issued, an historic tape that got issued by this this label organ of Corti a number of years later. Um, but other pieces, string quartets, certainly a piece which I think has one of the all-time greatest titles, Sunrise of the Interplanetary Dream Collector. I love it. <laughs> and, you know, that is an awesome string quartet. And, you know, as a composer in the in the early 80s, when, when that music came out, it made me want to write for string quartet. It got me excited about string quartet. And um, other pieces... The whole forehand stuff, you know, I'm hearing this forehand stuff on, on the, the new recording and it makes me really want to plunge into forehand. You know, we think of forehand music as this sort of 19th century salon thing, you know, Schubert and Schumann, and yeah, that music is wonderful, but it, it seems sort of of another era, of another time that might not necessarily speak to our time and, and to hear Terry's music for, for that idiom, for four hands on one piano really it convinces me that that's an extremely contemporary idiom as well. Um, so yeah, what else? 
uh, Chanting the Light of Foresight, the, the saxophone quartet that he wrote for Rova. Uh, now that's an example I say he wrote for Rova. That's a piece that's not completely notated. There's, there's a lot of improvisation in there because the members of Rova are extraordinary improvisers and he takes full, ad, full advantage and, and lets them you know, co-create the piece when they perform it in real time. So, you know, that that's another deeply moving thing. Another really favorite piece of mine of his is a long solo piano composition called The Harp of New Albion, mm. which is his very personal response to Lamont Young's The Well-Tuned Piano. The Well-Tuned Piano is this five hour plus long improvisatory Piano, solo piano composition for a retuned piano with these really far out intervals that go into some really you know trippy areas and 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 it's it's one of the the life changing pieces and and Terry wrote a much more I would say perhaps grounded in the sense that it could be processed it's like only about two hours long yeah. and the the tuning system used for it is also uses intervals that we don't normally hear in in Western music, but intervals that are a lot more readily discernible than some of the more far out intervals of the Welch and piano. And I think it's it's sort of a nice kind of entry point into that whole sound world of retuned keyboard pieces. So mm -hmm. that would be another piece I'd put forward and say that that's 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 a favorite piece as well. Yeah. But. But there, right, you know, but there were so many, you know, as, as soon as we're going to be done, I'm going to say, I forgot to mention this piece. I forgot to mention that. You know, all I, I'll say is, you know, there's a perfect excuse now. It's Terry Riley is has been on this planet for 80 years. He's created a lot of music. You know, later this month, June 24th, he will be the official 80th birthday. Everyone should, you know, buy themselves a birthday present. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> Get a number of these Terry Riley recordings, not just the ones I mentioned, and not just the new one that we're you know meeting together to talk about here, but all these others, and not just one performance, because as we were saying, you know, these improvisatory elements, you know, each like a great jazz artist, you hear different versions of a piece, and you're hearing different pieces. So you know, fill up your whole wall. <laughs> you can, you know, there are there are tons of great recordings out there to listen and. And oh, I, I just thought of another one. I think it's out of print now, though. This this wonderful um, Twin Cities-based, St. Paul, Minnesota-based new music ensemble, Zeitgeist, did a whole series of pieces with Terry, um, and they released a disc that's also extraordinary, wonderful, extraordinarily wonderful. Another whole side of Terry's compositional world, chamber ensemble pieces, and there were orchestra. Sadly, there haven't been too many recordings of his orchestra pieces. But there is re a recording, the Brooklyn Phil, a number of years back, did a recording of his piece, June Buddhas, which is worth checking out as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'm actually curious to ask you about um, one of the projects you mentioned earlier, A Rainbow in Curved Air. Is that right? Yes. Um, so I read that it was inspired by um, later develop, or it's inspired a lot of developments in electronic music, including The Who's Who Won't Get Fooled Again, um, and Baba O'Reilly, is, is that a tribute to Terry O'Reilly? Yeah, yeah, won't, won't get fooled again, um, the, which is which is Baba O'Reilly, it's, it's a song on, on one of the Who's late 60s rock records. It yeah. begins, if you listen to it, with this thing that totally sounds like a rainbow in curved air, and it was an homage, actually, to, to two people who Pete Townsend felt were very inspiring to him, Terry O'Reilly and, and Baba and Meyer Baba, so he called yeah. it Baba O'Reilly. And um, so you listen to the beginning of it, and it's totally, also not just not just the Who, there's a band that's, that's not as well known today as they perhaps should be. Another late 60s British band was called Curved Air. Mm -hmm. And they were named Curved Air because of this record. Right. And I mentioned you know, Brian Eno and Robert Fripp and the whole development of ambient music and the whole later development of new age music, which you know, in some quarters has a pejorative to some people. They think, oh, new age, it's easy listening, but you know, new age is a lot more than, than what the term came to be used pejoratively as for some people. And new age music can trace itself back to a rainbow and curved era as well. But also, you know, like all these synth players in the 70s, like Vangelis, um, in Greece, Kitaro, in Japan, Jean-Michel Jarre, 
mm. in uh, France. Um, Larry Fast, Synergy, who was really big in the late 70s. All that music, Tangerine Dream, mm -hmm. uh, a really important German space rock band, all that music owes itself to what Terry was doing in Rainbow and Curved Air. And I have to say something, you know, you, you sort of set me up at the beginning, say you're an authority on Terry Riley. I have to say, I haven't heard it all. And as I was thinking about Terry and preparing, to talk with you today. I went to Terry's website and it blew my mind. I heard something that I had never heard before. In 2007, you could go check this out on, on Terry Riley's personal website. Yeah. He did another performance of Rainbow and Curved Air, totally different as a trio. I think it's called a Rainbow and Curved Air Revisited. I'm, I might be getting that wrong, but if you pull up Terry Riley's website, you'll see it. And I, I was listening to it earlier today and it blew my mind. It's yet another whole take on that piece. And there were elements I'd never heard before in it. And then the familiar themes came in. You know, it's, um, there's a lot to explore there. Even for me, there's stuff that I, I've yet to hear, which is exciting. It means yeah. you know, there's more to check out. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's endless. It uh, stands the test of time, too. Um, so just to close out the Hangout, um, as you mentioned before, we're working the Zofo Plays Terry Riley, um, so an Illuminous album. Um, and we'd love to get your thoughts. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, it's an awesome album. I, I, I'd say it's like a wonderful coming together of two wonderful musical entities, you know, a person yeah. and, and this duo. Um, you know, very symbiotic relationship between them and Terry, much the same as his relationships with Kronos and um, to a, a lesser extent, Rova and Zeitgeist. But, you know, Terry, performers who have this deep, relationship with Terry, it becomes this ongoing thing where it isn't just about, oh, let's commission composer X to write a piece for Ensemble Y, and they'll play it maybe once or twice. If you get lucky, they'll tour it for a year and record it. Right. But it becomes this ongoing thing where they keep inspiring each other. And I'm hearing the seeds of that, obviously, with this album. I was very excited when I saw before this album came out, when it arrived and I, before I put it in my player and I had it in my hands because I was very excited about Zofa. We ran an article on New Music Box a couple of years back when they were just starting out. Um, Dustin Soyseth wrote this wonderful article about them and their approach to music making, which is worth checking out on New Music Box. And I thought, wow, with the kind of care that they have brought to so much music, It'll be really great to hear what they, they do with Terry. Because I have to say, you know, we've been talking about all these chamber ensembles, and I mentioned in passing that there hasn't been a lot of orchestral music on recording. The, Terry's also written a ton of orchestra music, and because of the way orchestras operate and their schedules and because there are so many people involved in the process, there hasn't been that same kind of nurturing with an orchestra, and that's something I hope now that he's turned 80, you know, that, that some orchestras will wake up and do that and do more of his orchestra music. Um, but groups like Zofo are really leading the way in terms of showing the kind of interaction that interpreters can have with a living composer. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's an exciting disc from start to finish. What's wonderful about it is you can't really tell where Terry ends and Zofo begins. And I say that because, as I mentioned earlier, not every piece on there was originally written as a piano forehand piece. Some of the pieces were actually transcribed by them with his blessing, and then he went back and added to them. And it's this wonderful organic process where it's just as much their work as it's his work, which is what's so special about his music, which you can't say for a lot of Western classical music where, you know, you're no. following the word text, you know, Beethoven wrote these notes and you better not play a B flat where it's a B natural <laughs> or the, you know, the musicology police will come after you and say, you know, that's wrong. Right. <laughs> oh man. Well, thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for joining us for our first Very Terry Tuesday segment. We're, we're so happy that you were able to do it today. Yeah, this was lots of fun. Thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so for those of you watching, please feel free to check out um, this Hangout on our YouTube page. Um, Crossover Media Net is the username. Um, I'll also be linking to Frank's new music box below. He has a couple links um, related to Zofo and Terry Riley that you can go check out. And we also have a very active website, crossovermedia.net, where you can get learn more about our artists, music news, and um, all these Hangouts that we're doing. 
so yeah, you can access our Facebook, Twitter, and SoundCloud in the upper right-hand corner as well. So thank you again, Frank. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.